All right. Well, again, good morning and welcome to the Master Financial Weekly Webinar for Life Insurance Sales. Again, the purpose of our business meetings these Wednesday mornings is to introduce you to different products, different sweet spots from our carriers, giving you the opportunity to have a little bit more confidence as you go out there and present different situations to your clients. Again, this is Mark Contra from the Messer office here in Charlotte, North Carolina. A couple little housekeeping items before we get started. Again, please, everyone on the line, uh, other than the presenter, please mute your phone. You should be muted by our system, but once in a while something escapes in. If you hear some background noise, it sounds like it's from your office. It probably is, so please make sure you're muted. Also, we have on the panel on the right-hand side an opportunity for you to type in any questions. We'd like to flow through the presentation one time and then come back and address the questions that you have. I'd also ask you to please stay with us until the very end giving me both an opportunity to review the benefits that have been set forth and also to bring to your attention a bonus that we will have available to you for being both on the webinar and bringing in your first piece of business. With all that in mind, again, I welcome Mr. Mark Berry, the Sales Vice President of Lincoln Financial. And Mark has taken the time in a previous webinar to bring forth a lot of good information and doing it on just a little different plateau, Mark is going to use the whiteboard, try to keep a little bit more interest than just having screens pop up in your face. So with all that, again, Mark, thank you very much for joining us this morning. Well, thank you, Mark, and it's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate this opportunity. Uh, what I want to share with everyone is a, a very simple drawing that tells a very powerful message. And this message I entitle the three L's of estate planning. Now, many of you have heard of the three L's of real estate. Uh, the three L's of real estate are location, location, and location. And that's a very profound statement. Whoever came up with that, that's a very good one. But what you're going to find is the three L's of estate planning are just as profound. And so uh, I'm going to start, you'll start to see a drawing here on your board. And again, this is a, a drawing that you can do as well. These are the three L's of estate planning. The first one is leverage on the bottom. The second one is liquidity. And bear with my handwriting. It's not good on a good day either. And the third is long-term chronic care. And so what do I mean by this? Well, what I mean by leverage is leverage in a financial sense is if you put some dollars in something, and at the end of it, you get a lot of dollars out. From a financial standpoint, that's leverage. And so for estate planning purposes, many of you on this call know that there is nothing that can match life insurance when it comes to leverage for an estate plan. Obviously, it's just in time when someone passes away. There's a very large amount compared to what was put in uh, of tax-free death benefit. But a lot of times that's what happens is when we set up the leverage, if you will, maybe even if it's in a trust, a lot of times advisors will walk away from a client thinking they've done their estate planning once that's done. But it's just as important to have liquidity for this person to live on for the rest of their life because without liquidity, what happens is the leverage gets canceled or policies get um, cash taken out of them. Um, or they, of course, lapse and go away. So liquidity is just as important, and it's and I'm including it as an estate plan because without liquidity, there will be no estate. But the third piece and the newest piece on this, and probably one of the most important, is that part of the um, plan in a client's life where, where we're in the estate depletion phase of their life, and that's where they might need uh, care for, for uh, long-term chronic illness, uh, and we'll get into that in a moment. But if you don't have that in place, what ends up happening is the estate gets spent down. One of the best ways to avoid estate tax is to spend down your estate, but I don't think that's the plan people want to do. Now, to hammer this point home, I want to tell you a story of a very famous mountain climber 
uh, many years ago, who in his day was the most famous mountain climber, and he was trying to become the first to climb Mount Everest. And he was asked by a reporter why he was going to all this trouble uh, to climb this mountain. And, and this gentleman uttered the most famous three words in mountain climbing history. He said, because it's there. Now, if I ask many of you on this call who you think said that, the, the answer I usually get is Sir Edmund Hillary, uh, which is not the, the person. But to his credit, Sir Edmund Hillary was credited with being the first to climb Mount Everest with his uh, Sherpa guide, Tenzing Norgay. And he did that in 1953, it's when he planted the flag up on top of Mount Everest. But those famous words were uttered by a gentleman named George Mallory. And I would include, encourage you to look him up sometime. Very interesting guy. George Mallory was actually, if, if you look at my drawing, there's an arrow. He was right about there on Mount Everest in 1924. Uh, now look at this. This is almost 30 years before Sir Edmund Hillary. George Mallory was within 800 feet of the top of Mount Everest. He was seen by some of his climbing companions getting over what's called the second step of Mount Everest. If you're familiar with Mount Everest, at the top there's three ledges that you have to get over, or steps, they call them. The second step or ledge is by far the most difficult. Uh, witnesses, a witness saw him and his climbing partner get over that second step uh, in 1924. And then George Mallory and his climbing partner disappeared and were never seen or heard from again. And so uh, when Sir Edmund Hillary made it to the top, he was aware, of course, of that story. Now, interestingly enough, on the 75th anniversary of George Mallory's climb in 1999, the television show Nova and the BBC commissioned an expedition to go up to Mount Everest, not to climb the mountain, but specifically to look for George Mallory and his climbing partner, see if they could find them. And interestingly enough, uh, they did find them. Now, before they went on this expedition, they interviewed George Mallory's daughter, who was still alive at the time, and she told them something very interesting. She said, if you find my father's body, look for a picture of my mom, which was his wife, in his wallet. He swore to her that if he ever made it to the top, he would leave that picture on the top of Mount Everest. When they found George Mallory, because of the cold, it was, everything was very well preserved. The forensics at the site suggested by the equipment he had and everything that George Mallory, when he fell, and it looks like that's what happened, was coming back down the mountain. Okay, the equipment he had, uh, the, uh, there was a puncture wound in his forehead, which is consistent with those pickaxes that they would use. When they're coming down the mountain, they would use those axes to slow their descent. And if they ever hit a rock or something hard, it would fly out. And what it looks like happened is that pickaxe flew out and struck him in the head. So they concluded he was coming down the mountain. But the most interesting part was in his, on his person was still his wallet that was very well preserved. And everything was in his wallet except that picture of his wife. And so, you know, the question becomes, was George Mallory the first to climb Mount Everest? No one, of course, will ever know. But Sir Edmund Hillary was very aware of that. And Sir Edmund Hillary said that uh, it's not good enough just to make it to the top of the mountain. In order for it to really count, you have to make it back down safely. And that's the point of this drawing. It's not good enough anymore to just plan for a client's uh, retirement to get them to retirement, right, to the top, if you will. It's just as important to plan for their entire life. And that's where I feel like this message is important, is to help us understand that to get to this idea of, a, of true estate planning, it's much more than just estate tax planning. And I think that's where we're stuck. A lot of us think that if a client's not worth more than $10 million, uh, if they're a couple, that there's no estate planning needed. But that couldn't be farther from the truth, as you can see here. It's really not about estate tax planning. It's about creating a situation where someone can pass on an estate of any size, whatever they can do. Now, the, the most important part of this piece that I mentioned, or at least the newest part, is this LTC part of this, the, the down, downward part of this uh, drawing, the part that George Mallory did not make it on. 
Now, one of the things that comes up a lot is when we talk to clients about becoming a chronic illness patient, we kind of blow through the criteria, right? We'll mention to a client that that means either you have a cognitive impairment, such as Alzheimer's, which is a mental uh, disability, or they lose the ability physically to do two of six activities of daily living. Now, it's interesting if I ask many of you on this call if you could name all six of the activities of daily living. Some of you probably could, but I think most of the time my experience is with a group of uh, financial professionals or insurance professionals, we struggle with all six. Uh, a lot of us can get four or five. Uh, usually, I, I usually joke if with a room full of all of us, with about 20 minutes, we could probably get all six of them. But So what I want to do is give you an easy way to remember all six. And I call this the ABCs of ADLs. And that's what I call it. ADL, of course, being activity of daily living. And so I'm going to share with you the ABCs of ADLs. Uh, the, the A, if you want to write this down, is simply ADLs. It helps you remember uh, what we're talking about. So uh, the first one, B, is bathing. And hopefully you can read partially my handwriting there. C is continence. Uh, D is dressing. I'll just I'll just put the letter because it's hard to read that. D is dressing. E is eating. F is flushing or toileting. That's the one that I think will help you remember. Don't call it flushing. You call it toileting. But that's an easy way to remember it anyway. And then G is getting up or transferring, right? So if you go through this list and you can memorize this, I think a lot of you would be able to recite uh, the six activities of daily living if you can put it in this uh, alphabetical order here. So that's a, that's a free gift to you today for being on the call. Now, why do I go to all this trouble? Why, what does this matter? I think as insurance professionals, we blow through this way too fast with our clients. And if you look at this list, uh, of what we're talking about here, and I ask you if you couldn't do two of these, or let's say just one of these, right? Which one would you pick? Right? If you really think about the frustration that people must face if they can't do some of these, but if you think about not being able to do one of these, that would be frustrating enough. But think about if you couldn't do two of these. You know, a lot of times if you've dealt with a long-term care situation, it isn't that you can't do two. Uh, sometimes they can't do four, or maybe even all six. And so that's a very emotional discussion for people, but I think it's important to go through this and help them understand what it means. Because I can tell you, uh, as I talk to financial advisors, if you have a client who's in your book of business, and they all of a sudden become a long-term care patient, chances are someone else is going to be coming in and taking over those assets because this person most likely is no longer in control of those assets. And so there's a chance, there's a flight risk, if you will, is that whoever comes in is going to take those assets to their own advisor and, and do that. So the, the point here being that it's very important for an advisor to understand that not only is this a good thing for their client, but frankly, it's a good thing for their own book of business, is to understand they need to help with this, this planning, if you will. And so the other thing that comes up, kind of the big buzzword nowadays uh, that's going on, is the difference between uh, reimbursement and indemnity. And if you haven't gotten into this discussion, it's a very interesting one. It's a powerful discussion as well. And so there's a big difference between indemnity and reimbursement. They both can be used as are important, but... Uh, there is a distinction, and so what I like to also show clients then is a, an easy way to remember kind of what I'm talking about here, and I entitle this part of this uh, the five steps of long-term care. And you that are on the call that have dealt with long-term care, many of you could will nod your head as I go through these five steps because you remember how this works. So the five steps of long-term care uh, are, are like this. I'm going to draw this over to the bottom left. The first step is that if they are still married, the spouse will take care of the person. Okay, So if they have a spouse, that person will be the one that takes care of them 
uh, and, and for many reasons. One is because they, they happen to live with them. Uh, but the other thing is they're probably the one that cares about them the most as well, at least we hope so. Right? But what happens is eventually the spouse needs help. And that's where I came in actually twice in this drawing because I was at the second step known as the kids. And so the, and that's supposed to be a D, S, uh, the kids come in. And uh, the kids then help because the spouse needs help and the kids step in and they do their best uh, to help out. Now what's nice about these first two steps from a financial standpoint is that there's no out-of-pocket cost for the spouse or the kids to care for them. At least most kids wouldn't charge them, right? And so from a financial standpoint, so far so good. We haven't spent any money on this. Now, we'll get into that in a minute, what this really means. But then eventually what happens is the kids need help. And this is the next step, if you will. Uh, you step down here, and the reason it goes down is because this is the at-home phase where you have somebody come to the home and care for them or help care for them. On, on average right now in the United States, it's about $21,000 a year to have a person come to the home. And this is a part-time thing. This isn't moving in. This is just coming in, administering meds, uh, helping with physical therapy or bathing or whatever. So uh, that would be the next step is that you get the, the, uh, uh, the at-home uh, care. And it doesn't seem to be showing up up there, but it will get there eventually, hopefully. And so uh, the next step after the at-home care is assisted living. And when you get to assisted living, these are beautiful facilities uh, that uh, provide care and help for people. And you know, you, a lot of times you'll see the commercial where the lady says, I've fallen and I can't get up. And so uh, that's what we're talking about here. Assisted living right now on average is around $42,000 a year. And the last phase is nursing home. right? And nursing home, nobody wants to get to. But if you make it that far, it's around ninety-one or ninety-two thousand a year. So what you get, if if uh, if it'll show up here in a minute, is um, you get this step-down function that shows once you get past the kids, there's true out-of-pocket cost for uh, for long-term care. Uh, and it looks like I have lost my connection here, so we'll keep talking through this. But um, the um, the point being is that if you have the spouse or the kids caring for this person and you have a reimbursement policy, there's no reimbursement. Right? Those aren't professional costs. What, what a reimbursement policy does is it covers those last three phases of the, uh, of the care for this person. Um, what indemnity does is it covers the first two phases. And why this is important is this. Only 22% of the long-term care patients in the United States right now are being covered in those last three phases of the steps of this drawing that you can't see. 78% uh, of long-term care patients right now as we speak on this call are being cared for by a spouse or the kids. And there's no reimbursement available to them from a policy that has reimbursement. And the reason I go through that is, Life insurance policies, as many of you know on this call now, have new riders on them that offer these long-term chronic illness riders where you can accelerate the death benefit to cover this type of situation. And so um, those are many times indemnity. And that's where we can cover these first two phases because what happens with indemnity is that you actually get a check coming to the people, to whoever is in control of this, to help them with these costs. Uh, it's typically uh, up to an IRS per diem, okay, and uh, that's how we get this covered. And so, if you if you can talk to clients about this idea too of having these indemnity type riders, and maybe even addition to an existing long term care policy, now what you're talking about is a true, complete, holistic uh, estate plan. And that's kind of the point. Back to the drawing here is that uh, the the leverage at the bottom is most of the time covered with life insurance. Of course, liquidity can come in many forms. And then the third piece, that long-term chronic illness, can come in a couple of ways too, uh, either through a classic long-term care policy. There's a, a Lincoln policy known as Money Guard that can help with this. 
Uh, both of those are reimbursement, but also the new riders in these policies. Now, unfortunately, what it doesn't look like we're going to be able to show anything because I believe I've lost connection, Mark, and I uh, apologize for that. Can't fix that. But what I wanted to do was take a moment and talk about a specific type of product that's available that can cover all three of these. And I call it a hybrid product, but many of you can sell these as well. This would be any permanent life insurance policy that has a cash value component to it that also has the rider. And that, of course, is a very popular. Uh, Lincoln's most popular one right now is known as VUL1. It, it, this is a variable product, but it has a, a cash component to it as well, but it's a guaranteed death benefit. And so that's what I'm getting at is any of these policies, and there's, there's a few of them out there on the market, but if you can offer all three of those in one product, what we're really talking about is a situation where uh, it looks like I've been totally disconnected now, Mark, so hopefully that's up there. But um, it, it's a situation where you can, cr you can offer this product. Now, I have my internal partner on here, Aviel Johnson. And Aviel, they're not going to be able to see the screen, but I wanted, if you could, step through real quick some of the features of the product uh, best you can to explain what we're talking about, about the, all three of those. So Aviel? Uh, I don't believe we have Aviel. <laughs> so, Is anyone uh, so, able to hear me? There, there you are. Go ahead, Aviel. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Okay, um, I actually am able to see your screen, Mark. I'm not sure if anyone else can at this point. Oh, good. If you can see it, that's great. Okay. Um, so as Mark mentioned, Lincoln does have a product that can provide your client with the leveraged liquidity and that long-term chronic care coverage, and that's the VUL1. So if you're not able to see it, we were going to show you here um, a VUL1 illustration for a 45-year-old male excuse me, with a million dollars of death benefit. So in this case, if the client were to pay an annual premium of $9,972, that leverages them to a $1 million tax-free death benefit, and that death benefit is going to be guaranteed, even if the account value drops to zero. As long as the premiums are paid, they have that death benefit. So secondly, it's going to give the client that liquidity, has a cash value component that grows tax deferred inside of the policy. So if anyone's able to see this, um, on page 10, if you look at year 20, the cash value in the policy is $179,416. This, um, this type of policy excuse me, is also going to give the client the opportunity to stop paying premiums due to the market's good return. So when you hit certain accumulation value thresholds, the premiums can be stopped, and you have a guaranteed paid-up policy that can also provide liquidity and free up premium dollars. And if you're able to see on page 11, there's a symbol in um, year 46, an at symbol, and that shows when the policy um, is paid up and premiums are no longer necessary. The VUL1 also provides the client with market-driven growth potential, growth potential um, with more than 75 funds to choose from, 11 fund of funds, and three exchange-traded funds. And also, it has that long-term chronic care component. If the client, if the insured is permanently chronically ill, they're able to receive a maximum monthly benefit payment. That's 2% of the gross death benefit, or the maximum IRS daily per diem limit, and it's whichever is the lesser of the two. And there's a page in this illustration as well that um, kind of lays that all out for you. So if you're not able to see it, we can you know, discuss that later on. Um, and with this rider, it also provides lapse protection. So once the client is on claim, no more premiums are required. And as Mark mentioned, it's convenient. No receipts or reimbursements are required. And the funds can be used wherever needed. So with that, 
that's the VUL one. And if anyone has any questions on that or needs any help illustrating, I would be happy to help. So I will give it back to you, Mark. Thank you, Aviel. Uh, I think the point of all of this, and hopefully this came through, is that um, if you haven't talked about estate planning with your clients in a while because of the estate tax and how large it would have to be, uh, the how large of an estate they would have to be, now is a great time to bring that discussion up again, but in a different way. There's really talk about estate planning in a more holistic approach of looking at taking care of them while they're still alive as well. Uh, but certainly looking at that long-term chronic care uh, piece at the end as well to preserve the estate that you can create. So it's really not about estate tax anymore. It's really about all three of the L's, if you will, of the leverage, liquidity, uh, and the long-term uh, chronic care. So with that, Mark, I'll turn it back over to you. And uh, if there's any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Yes, and again, thank you very much, Mark. And Avila for sharing the information with us. Uh, the program itself, as far as the little triangle, certainly an easy way, I think. A lot of agents still like to use that yellow pad, and this gives you that opportunity to do that with your client, give them something in demonstration format. Uh, certainly also the nice little history story, keep us entertained and interested in what was coming forward. Uh, thank you for that. And then, of course, the real basic A to Ds, the uh, activities of daily living to help us all better remember those six qualifications. The next question, though, that I would have, Mark, is uh, I guess we might have had a misconnection on the audience because there probably is not even one person on this webinar this morning that has a series license. So what oh. we're really looking for is a UL product that has that long-term care rider that we can work with. And, and what product might that be with Lincoln for that opportunity? Yeah, with, with Lincoln it's several. One is our guaranteed universal life uh, that, of course, has the guaranteed death benefit component. And you can have the rider. I think almost all of our permanent products have the rider available. Another very popular one right now is an index UL. And that's become uh, quite popular lately. The growth in that uh, industry, that side of the industry, uh, is uh, exponential. And so uh, there are index UL products that would feature, of course, the S&P 500 with a floor and a ceiling on that. Uh, we Ours has a floor of 1%, which is a very popular uh, product. Most of them out there have a floor of zero. And so if you can offer something like that to the client, with that liquidity potential, but especially with the 1% floor, where they don't have to worry about another 2008, right? I, I think that helps as well. And obviously, you can add the rider uh, to that product, the uh, a chronic illness rider as well. OK, good. And, and that's, I think, where we're going to need to uh, draw upon the expertise of the Lincoln Group, and again, they're always out there to help as we are here at Messer. So if you do feel as an agent that you need some support in that area, uh, if you do feel you'd like to learn more about how to use that universal life product, whether it be a guaranteed product or an index product, the additional rider to cover these costs, uh, please give us a call and we'll get down and dirty with you. I uh, don't see that I have any other questions. Also, I would always like to add is agents, be sure if you're not already uh, appointed, use our handy tool on the Messer website to get your contract work in for Lincoln Financial. Uh, there are other wonderful permanent products that they have. And of course, one of the good things about their products, Mark, could you touch on the uh, convertibility <clears throat> of what's available if, if an agent does choose to use your term product first? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up, Mark, because we've just announced we are repricing our term uh, once again, uh, and it's a very positive story. So if you haven't looked at Lincoln term in a while, especially for your larger cases, a uh, million dollars or more, I would greatly encourage you to look at us once again, because we are, uh, we're back, if you will, uh, in the term market. 
and what's nice about our term insurance is it has that conversion option or convertibility option, if you will, to convert to any of our permanent products that are available at the time of the conversion, which is a very nice feature because we have some very popular permanent products and uh, we don't limit the client on which of those they can convert to. So it's a, it, and it also is for the entire uh, term. Uh, so if you've got a 20-year term policy, you have 20 years to convert and, of course, lock in your health. And so, again, if you haven't considered Lincoln in a while or run uh, us on your spreadsheets with term, I would encourage you to uh, start doing that once again and take a look because you might be surprised. And this is probably getting a little bit too deep and a little bit too out there with underwriting, but if you had a client that did a term product, and then found themselves suffering two of the six activities, had the option to convert to that more permanent product, would they be able to add that rider for long-term care, or would that be a disqualified based on current condition? Yeah, currently the way it would work is if you wanted to add the rider at the conversion, they would have to go through the underwriting part for the rider. They would always have the life insurance component uh, obviously, because that's guaranteed. But to add the rider at conversion, there would be a uh, an underwriting uh, criteria for that. So they would have to be underwritten for the rider at that point. Mark, that's a very good point, very good question. There is talk. I'll just give you guys a heads up. I don't know where we're going to go with this, but there is talk, of course, about offering that rider on the term product when you purchase it, you know, right then. So uh, that, of course, would solve... Uh, that issue. I don't know where that is uh, in the process or whatever, but that's obviously being discussed because I think your question comes up a lot, Mark, and it's a very good one about that conversion option because people do want these riders now. That's become a very popular feature. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, and most of these riders, I would assume, on the UL product um, have very little, if any, cost to add them in the beginning. That correct? Well, no, there's a cost, uh, but it's minimal for the benefit that you're getting. Obviously, there would be a cost to add that, but uh, you know, it depends on the age of the client and how long the policy is and, and that type of thing. So, I think when you get there, is uh, just have us uh, certainly I'll be available, or you guys, of course, can run it too, Mark. But run the numbers and do the comparison with and without the rider, just to give the client, uh, you know, that idea of what it would cost to get it. Excellent, excellent. Uh, one of the other things that was brought out here by one of our agents on the line uh, was wondering uh, about your <coughs> disability product, knowing that you do have some good DIs available as well. Yeah, we're, we're not in that market uh, as, as a pure disability product. We are working on a uh, product that would include disability with life insurance uh, and the long-term chronic illness uh, as well. So that's in the works. That's something we're uh, working on. And there's a, I think there's a very small pilot right now looking at that. So if we got in the disability market, it wouldn't be pure disability. It would be a, a kind of a hybrid product similar to Money Guard, if you're familiar with that, that type product. That, that would be the direction that we would go. Great. Um, and I know you mentioned that we have these opportunities perhaps coming soon. What type of a window are we looking at for that repricing on the term products? Aviel, do you know uh, the date that that was happening? For some reason, I thought it was very soon, like in the next week or so. Do you happen to know? Yes, I believe I want to say it is the 14th. It's around that time. So Monday, this coming Monday. That's excellent. Again, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, if you're familiar with the Messer website, if you're using our quoting tool, you'll be able to see that effective change as the competitive pricing comes out at that time. And also, just for your information, ladies and gentlemen, if you are using that quoting tool and you do see a product that you like, uh, by clicking on that product name, it's going to tell you more about the riders, and that should verify if you have that long-term care rider with that particular product. 
Okay, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we were going to look at some bonusing, and that bonusing does have to do with the sale being submitted to us within the next 30 days, uh, a Lincoln Financial product. And we'll open it up to any product that they have, including the newly priced term products. If you'll bring us that application in 30 days, having been registered and a participant and your names are listed, so we know if you really were here today, uh, we'll get that policy issued for you as quickly as possible, hopefully within 30 days of actually sending it into us, and then be able to pay you an additional $100 bonus on top of your normal commission for the sale of that product. Once again, Mark, uh, thank you very much again for the whiteboard, making it a little more interesting and a little different. Evie for being with us also to add some additional input. And with that again, ladies and gentlemen, we'll look forward to being together again next week uh, on Wednesday the 16th, and we'll have our presentation at that time from another one of our carriers. Again, thank you all very much. Bye Thank you. Thanks, Mark. You're welcome.